You know that, are you there? Yes, sir. Yeah, uh, you have uh, uh, muted everybody, you know? Yes, sir, everybody is on mute. Okay, and in the in the waiting list, if you see Narendra Pani, just let him in. Okay, sir, sure. Yeah, I asked him to come at 2.55, and okay. once he is in, then make him co-host. Okay, sir, sure. So, participants should not be allowed to unmute, no, sir? No, they should not be allowed to unmute. If they want to ask question, I am co-host. No, I can make them, I can request them to uh, pick up, no? Okay, sir. Yes, sir, you can. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So, we will allow participant to come in only at 3 o'clock, not now. Okay, sir, sure. Good afternoon. Hello. Good afternoon, Professor Pani. How are you? I'm good. Yeah. <laughs> How are you? I'm very good. Yeah, I can hear you well. Right. Uh, do you want to uh, show something or do you have a PowerPoint? I have a or... Yes, I have a presentation. I will, I'll share it at that point. 
Okay, yeah, sure, yeah. Mm -hmm. What I will do is I will make you co-host. Yeah, you are already co-host. Mm -hmm. So you will have all the rights to do whatever you want. Uh, so you can share. And then I also wanted to check, uh, would you like me to summarize maybe some questions that come in the chat box and you want me to do it at the end? Sure. Sure, yeah. that's fine. That'll yeah. be fine. Yeah. So uh, maybe... I'm not able to... Uh, can you see me or are you just hearing me? No, I am only hearing you. I am not able to see you. Uh, I think that is a... Yes, now I can see you. Right. Yeah. And you want to try your PowerPoint to upload? Yeah, I'll do that. I'll just... I'm not able to. You have it open on your computer? Yeah, it's open, but I'm not able to find the usual screen for Zoom meetings. Yeah, yeah. I, I think I've got it now. Let's see. Yeah, now it is coming. Yeah, it is come. Right. You want to make it full screen because now I am yeah. seeing the... Yeah, I'll just do that. Is it there? Yes, that's very good, yeah. So if you want, you can just leave it as it is. So. Because I don't intend to say anything apart from saying just two sentences to introduce you and mm -hmm. I will just hand over to you completely. So maybe I can just stop, pause the share. Okay, sure, as you wish, or you can leave it as it is also. I am fine either way. Okay. We have two more minutes and then we could let people to come in. Right. Quite a lot of participants are uh, names which I don't know because they are out from outside university. So <laughs> <laughs> I know some open, names only. It's an open, open lecture. So, right. So you yeah. can open up the discussion and see how it goes. Yeah. Is it the full screen right now? Right now it is not full screen. I am seeing the panel on the left side. Oh. Earlier it was full screen. Right, I don't know why. Is it full screen yeah. now? Now it is full screen. Right. So let's just leave it at that. Yeah. I'm very glad you accepted it because uh, uh, some of my friends from Europe also wanted to come for this. They right. said they want to see the recording because uh, uh, there is a good debate on <laughs> right. whether this is really two views or same view. So we like to hear from you right. what you think about it. Yes. I think the two different views. Anyway, we'll discuss it after. The, yes, yes. After I've tried to make my case. Yeah. Right. So it is three o'clock. Shall we let people in? Maybe yeah. at the moment there are 26 people waiting. Uh, my experience is the numbers go up to 40 or so right. later. Yeah. 
we leave it i leave it to you i'm entirely in your hands okay yeah so we will we'll just give a start right Yeah. Hello, good afternoon, uh, friends. Uh, welcome to the third lecture in the series to celebrate the 50th anniversary of the publication of A Theory of Justice by John Rawls. Uh, in the last two lectures, we have primarily seen the main uh, counters of John Rawls' theory. And one of the issues that came up in those series was uh, whether the second principle of John Rawls is a replication of uh, Gandhian talisman. And because Narendra Pani has accepted to take on this challenge and to enlighten us. And I don't need to explain or introduce Professor Pani quite a lot. Uh, Professor Pani is a well-known um, Gandhian economist, economist by training but his contributions in the area of land reforms, in the area of uh, uh, the urban studies are quite uh, well known. And therefore, uh, uh, we don't need uh, a long introduction to his uh, contribution to social science, but rather we are all excited to hear what he wants to say about this topic. Professor Pani also has agreed to take a few questions at the end of his exposition on this subject, uh, and uh, we will have some time for uh, reflection. At the same time, I encourage all of you to put on your on the chat box um, whenever you have a reflection or a question. But all of them we will pick up for discussion at the end of uh, the, the exposition on the topic. So, with that, welcome to Professor Pani, and then we look forward to hear to you. Over to you. Thank you, Professor Pelisari, that was uh, for your kind yeah. work and introduction. Uh, I would, uh, in a sense, uh, this is a topic that one will get to for the reason you mentioned, that is the similarity between John Rawls' second principle and Gandhi's talisman. But I think the uh, rather than look at it in terms of those specific uh, kind of differences or similarities, I would, it would be necessary to capture two very different uh, kind of perspectives on what is essentially the role of fairness in our understanding of justice. In a sense, to look at Rawls, John Rawls and M.K. Gandhi in the same, through the same lens uh, is both an, a kind of obvious uh, way of doing things as well as an unusual one. It is an obvious route to take because fairness is central to both their ideas of justice. The, the Rawls uh, uh, builds his theory of justice of uh, the book that we're celebrating 50 years today uh, is one uh, which is uh, built around the idea of, of this case that he makes for justice as fairness, a case that as people have argued has altered over time, has been modified over time, but nevertheless, the central theme is that justice is fairness. Right? And for Gandhi, of course, fairness is the, is the central theme, but, but in ways that are very, very different. So in order to look at it, the, the reason why we find that uh, fairness, that the Rawls-Gandhi kind of comparison is, is unusual, is more, I think, a statement of the distance between academia and practical politics. Because Gandhi, for a while, uh, uh, he's someone who's a thinker, whose uh, ideas have not always got acceptance, even with his, dis uh, with his disciples. And Nehru, who he had uh, built a case for to be become the prime minister of India, uh, in, a, in a letter in 1945, which is uh, a, a quite uh, almost impatient, even curt, clearly tells Gandhi that uh, none of his ideas regarding uh, what he had put out uh, in his original uh, original work uh, was worth consider was to be considered that he had never demanded that the Congress consider it and therefore it was never a part of of the Congress kind of uh, of statement of way, of the way forward. So in a sense, what we need to do when you look at Rawls and Gandhi is try and capture Rawls kind of uh, ideas and as well as we need an interpretation of Gandhi's ideas more than his political ach achievements. 
So I'll try and bridge that gap in terms of, uh, of four real steps. First, I will try to briefly conceptualize what I think is a theory of justice as fairness. What are the basic requirements of such a contention? Then I will go into the concept of fairness that John Rawls uses. I'll move on to the role of fairness in Gandhi's uh, approach uh, to, uh, to politics or to political thought. And then I will look at the divergence between the world uh, of Gandhi and that, uh, and that of, uh, and, and that of uh, uh, of Rawls, uh, particularly, I would say the divergence which I would take is actually a divergence in uh, uh, between um, uh, between uh, between the world of rationality and the world of action. Right. To begin with, the idea the idea of fairness, uh, I think the foundational. I would go with Amartya's idea of what a, a, a theory of justice as fairness or the idea of justice uh, as fairness should actually con, uh, consist of. So the foundational idea, the idea of fairness here the, can be given shape in various ways. I'm just citing Amartya Sen here, but it must be a demand uh, uh, to avoid bias in our evaluations, taking note of the interests and concerns of others as well, and in particular, the need to avoid being influenced by our respective uh, vested interests or by our personal priorities or eccentricities or prejudices. So essentially, this is really the idea of fairness is built into the idea of impartiality. Right? But whatever the way we look at what is impartial, we need to see it in terms of, it forms the basis for any conception of justice as fairness. Right? Uh, once you we take that, uh, idea of, uh, of fairness built into it, you need to then look at the movement from fairness to justice. And this requires a, a little more, uh, I would say, argument as to as what happens at the next step. Uh, it's really uh, not, not my place to try and define justice in a, in a setting of, of, a, of the national law school. But nevertheless, just to uh, we just need to take note of a fact that in the wide range of definitions that would be available, there is a, uh, we, there is a case for going back to the sixth century Roman, uh, uh, Roman view in the Institutes of, of Justinian, where he sees justice, or, or it is laid out, that justice is the set and constant purpose which gives to every man his due. Now this construct uh, raises four specific issues. Uh, each of which uh, I think virtually every major theory of justice uh, goes through, right? Uh, the first idea is, is justice as individual claims, that there are specific claims and, and justice uh, has an element of an individual claim, uh, claim uh, in, built into that. The second is the idea of justice as an enforceable obligation. Third is the idea of justice and impartiality. And fourth is the idea of justice and agency. Virtually every theory of justice has an idea of an, what is an individual claim that that element is uh, that uh, something is justice, something that is claimed. It is something that is demanded. We demand justice, but uh, sort of beg for mercy, if you like. So you're really looking at it as in terms of, of uh, justice as an individual claim. It is also an enforceable obligation. It is something that I can say as a right that you must do the following things. And it is has an element of impartiality. It is not something that I can take one point of view at one point of time and, and uh, look at it differently. And there is the justice and agency. There must be an agency that can, uh, uh, that can influence the course of events in a way that makes it more just, or for that matter, unjust. Now in fairness, as I move from fairness to justice, each of these broad claims that are built into a, a Justinian sort of uh, construct, right, has a, a place for fairness at the, at the center of that. There's a fairness as the, when I'm looking at it in terms of in individual claims, fairness is the inclusion of interests of other individuals and groups, not just my own interests, right? Justice as an enforceable obligation, fairness is then not just something that is desirable, but it's something that I can enforce or is enforceable, right? 
justice and impartiality, that is the, that is the fairness, the demand for fairness would mean there's an absence of bias, prejudice and self-interest. And the agency uh, would demand or require that the existence of individuals and groups can generate fairness and unfairness. There are people who can actually do that. So when you take these four as basically the idea of fairness or the movement from fairness to justice is that I'm able to look at the interests of others I have in a way that is enforceable and which has to have without the bias, prejudice and self-interest and with the power to actually uh, generate this requirement, right? So there is then a clearly, a theory of justice as fairness must have a clearly defined path from fairness to justice. And that path would require institutions to make it stable. I'll just use John Rawls definition of institutions here, whereas uh, as a public system of rules, which defines their uh, duties, powers and, and immunities, right? And, uh, uh, this essentially uh, implies that there is a, a possible form of conduct by a system of rules and second as the realization of the thought and of certain persons at a certain time and place. In short, what we're really looking at is really two aspects of institutions. One is, re is really the idea uh, is of an abstract object, an abstract uh, institute idea, if you like, an abstract construct. And the other is how it actually works in practice. So institutions can be seen as a set of rules and also as the institutions of practice, what, how those rules are, are followed, through, uh, followed through in practice, right? So now if we look, go move over to Rawls and see the way I know, once again, I'm dealing with, uh, with an audience from the, from the law school, but still let me just very briefly outline its uh, major features that we need to make the case that I'm trying to make. The first uh, idea of fairness in Rawls is that the principles that free and rational persons concerned to further the interest would accept in any initial position of equality is as defining the fundamental terms of that association. So in, in other words, what we're really looking at is, uh, is a basic idea of, uh, of fundamentally that there is a position you start from and this position can be determined by free and rational persons. And this, I think, is critical to the theory of justice and indeed for, for all of Rawls' work. And that is, it assumes that it is something that can be put together by free and rational persons. Implicit in that approach is that it is contractarian. It's based upon the social idea of a social contract. And second, that is a social contract developed by rational persons. It puts rationality at the center of the, uh, of the case for fairness. That if I work the way it, the theory of, of justice, of fairness to justice, the path from fairness to justice is to be done is through uh, a clearly rationally defined means, right? So the first step here is to identify what is uh, a sense of fairness. And in justice as fairness, the original position, I'm quoting Rawls again, uh, the original position of equality corresponds to the state of nature in the traditional theory of social contract, right? The original position is understood as a purely hypothetical situation characterized so as to lead us to a certain conception of justice. Among the essential features of this situation is that no one knows his place in society, his class position or social status nor does anyone know his fortune in the distribution of natural assets and abilities, his intelligence, strength, and the like. The principle of justice, principles of justice are chosen behind a veil of ignorance. The idea of fairness here is if I do not know which side I am on, I will be able to, any jud judgment I make will be necessarily fair, right? I will not, my biases would not come into play. Right, though it could be argued that prejudices might implicitly come in, but if I really do not know which side I'm on, I would be able to have, a, and there is a case for a set of rational people to put it together, then I wouldn't quite uh, have uh, have any bias, any uh, influence on it, and that original position is based on the fact that I do not know, and therefore it is it would be fair. Right, so the veil of ignorance is really the source of fairness in this in the Rawlsian uh, Rawlsian construct. 
Right. Now, the movement from that original position based upon a veil of fairness to the principles of justice is a rational process involves. He's only talking about a social contract that can be uh, brought, put together by people who are rational and uh, rational beings. Right? So the, on the basis of rationality then, he arrives at two uh, principles that are for him center to the, central to the idea of justice as fairness. The first principle is that each person is to have an equal right to the most extensive total system of equal civil uh, basic liberties uh, compatible with a similar, uh, similar system of liberty for all. Right. So what you're talking about here is, is not just equality of opportunity, but also a widespread access to a total to a system of liberties. So there is an idea of freedom built into it, and there is an, a necessity of everyone having equal access, uh, access to that, uh, uh, to that freedom. And the second principle, which is once again, something that we'll come back to later after discussing uh, Gandhi as well. And that is that social and economic inequalities are to be arranged so that they are both to the greatest benefit of the least advantaged, uh, uh, right? Consistent with the just savings principle. That is that you need to save something to maintain future generations at the, the whole idea of, of the just savings. So to the greatest benefit of the least advantage, taking into account the idea of just savings and be attached to the offices and positions open to all under conditions of fair equality, equality uh, and opportunity or equality of opportunity. So what we're really uh, looking at here are, is a principle which says that uh, when that you need to look at it and arrange it in a way that benefits the worst off. Right, it is what in welfare economics is termed the maximum principle that I judge a situation in terms of what it does to the least advantage. In this case, there's a demand that the economic inequalities that have to be arranged because talking of equality in an unequal society, right, is necessarily regenerates that inequality. So, justice there demands that you have further economic inequalities that correct past wrongs. And those social and economic inequalities are to be arranged so that they benefit the, the least advantaged, right? So that is at the heart. These two principles are rationally arrived at and Rawls argues that the original positions will only lead us to these two principles or they should lead us to these two principles. Okay. So the, when you're looking from these principles, he further makes this case that you move to the working of institutions. And the institutions that you're talking about, you right, know, have to function on the basis of two, uh, two priorities. The first is the priorities uh, of liberty, you right? know, and uh, the, the priority of liberty is that the principles of justice are to be ranked in lexical order and therefore liberty can be restricted only for the sake of liberty, right? That if uh, while every individual gets, it has the right to do whatever uh, uh, they, really, they really want, right? that has to be restricted only when it hurts the ability of others to do what they really want, right? So the only case that you can make for a restriction of liberty of any kind is that uh, it hurts the liberty of others, right? And that, that is to repeat, the, uh, they are to be ranked in an order where liberty can be restricted only for the sake of liberty. Right? The second priority or the second uh, role that institutions must play is, uh, is the develop a priority of justice over efficiency and welfare. When there is an issue where, there is, where efficiency and welfare defines a course of, actus, uh, of, uh, uh, of action that might be un unjust, uh, just priority has to be of justice over both efficiency and welfare. So the second principle of, uh, of, uh, of justice is lexically prior to the principle of efficiency, right? Uh, and, to, and to that of maximizing the sum of advantage and fair opportunity is prior to the difference principle. So what you're saying really is that these elements are prior 
right to the difference principle and that you have justice and uh, would have greater priority over the elements of, of efficiency. Right? So this uh, then is in, in a nutshell, the argument that Rawls makes. One is that you have original, uh, the original position with the veil of ignorance, not knowing which side you'll be air on when deciding a particular issue as the, as the starting point of justice as fairness. That basic original position leads to, uh, to the two principles of, uh, of fairness. And those principles in turn demand these two priorities. And let me just uh, repeat and re-emphasize that this entire process is carried out uh, or is worked out in the realm of rationality. Right. Now, and you look at Gandhi as the alternative view that we are trying to understand today, there is, I think, a little more groundwork to be done. As I mentioned at the outset, Gandhi's uh, uh, work is not, uh, is not widely, uh, is, uh, Gandhi's idea of political thought is not widely recognized. Gandhi is seen ever since he was sort of promoted upstairs, if you like, uh, uh, to take on the position of a Mahatma. He has been uh, admired as a person, if you like, or hated as a person, as his assassins and their followers would say. But essentially, it has, is the personality of, the, uh, of Gandhi uh, has overridden his ideas in many ways. This was probably inevitable for a man who believed that his life was his message. But uh, I think it's important if you're trying to gain from it to go back to Gandhi and see why, despite, for instance, in the Indian context, where uh, he has been the, the widely attacked by theoreticians of all kinds. The Marxists don't like him, the, li the liberals don't like him. Uh, very, very few people, uh, very, in fact, no, there's virtually no political stream uh, in surviving major political stream in India that has been supportive uh, supporter of Gandhi. He was not liked by the Congress. He wasn't liked by the Loyites, certainly not by the Marxists, and certainly, uh, again, not so by, uh, by, the, uh, by the Hindutva, uh, Hindutva groups. So what we're really, uh, really seeing is, uh, is trying to reconstruct. What we need to do is that despite this, this sort of uh, political sort of uh, negation of Gandhi, the fact is that on the ground, at various points of time, at all the turning points of India's political history, there is a resort to his methods. There is a resort to Satyagraha. There is a, a resort to, to actions of the kind. There is a resort to civil disobedience. On a large scale, we are seeing it in the farmers' agitation. We saw it before that in the CA movement. And years or even decades before, we saw it in the movement against the emergency. So what is it about the Gandhian approach that survives despite and, uh, and the rejection by all the political streams. And I think this, uh, we therefore need to construct this approach and the starting point for it at the heart of this approach is the primacy of action. Right? It's really about what people want to do and, and how they carry out what they want to do. So there is the urge of act, to act at any point of time. And that urge is built around the knowledge that is available to us at a point of time, right? That knowledge, uh, we might know certain things and therefore based on that or what we believe we know, we might go forward uh, forward to act, act upon it, right? It's emph the emphasis here is the belief that you know something, right? This, within that knowledge, there is a choice of specific aspects of knowledge that you choose to use. You might choose to, uh, to use the knowledge thrown up about uh, dem the functioning of democracies. You might uh, choose to use the knowledge about, uh, about violence, uh, about the use of violence in politics. It depends upon what knowledge you want to use. There's a, so it's not just the knowledge that's available to society at a point of time, but it's also the choice of a specific element of knowledge that you want to, to use when, when you act. And that choice depends a lot on the person concerned. Right? And uh, there is an emphasis on the individual as to how they would react to a particular situation, and therefore what is the, what the kind of urge to act that they develop. Uh, the uh, this upward is one aspect of it. The second aspect is how, how do they go about carrying out the action, right? The element that is uh, uh, critical to it really is that you're really talking about uh, 
uh, about the means and the means that I choose would determine how an action actually carries out. If I carry out an action through violent means that will have one kind of an impact. If I carry out the same action on this or build the same based on the same case through means that are non-violent, non it will have a different impact. So what we're looking at, at then is, is the kind of means that the, we choose to carry out an action and the process of implementation of those means. Huh? This is where you would bring in your idea of efficiency and welfare, as you also would put it. But essentially, it's looking at how does one uh, implement a particular, uh, particular you, uh, how do I use the means to implement a particular urge to act? And this, once again, depends on the person concerned. Right? Uh, the idea of the individual and person here also uh, differs uh, from uh, 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 from Rawls. Uh, we'll, though we'll get into differences in more or more specific detail. But I think it's important to recognize that that for Gandhi uh, and indeed for Ambedkar, is in, uh, both in 1916, defined uh, looked at persons in terms of some things that could uh, were basically very uh, sort of. Um, they basically challenged the Western notion that you need to understand the individual and society. And those were the two constructs that you used to understand society. For both Gandhi and Ambedkar, it was important to recognize that individuals tended towards groups. Gandhi, in fact, in 1916, defined that, that propensity to uh, prefer our immediate surroundings in, in various dimensions as Swadeshi. And Ambedkar, in the same year, writing uh, uh, writing, a, uh, uh, making a presentation in a seminar course in Colombia was equally contemptuous of the idea that you could understand society purely in terms of individuals uh, and society as a whole, and that you needed to have a theory of groups or, or formation of groups and groups built into it. Gandhi went a step further than Ambedkar and spoke about the individual. I mean, this, of course, is drawn from uh, uh, from a much earlier school of, of uh, Indian of Indian thought, uh, one of the Vedic schools, where he argued that essentially the in, uh, the ind individual has uh, uh, can have is, how an individual acts or behaves is built upon three uh, gunas, if you like, which is the pure, uh, the sattvic, the rajasic, the tamasic. That is the pure, the desirous, if you like, and and the uh, and the dark. Right? But what is important is that these gunas are not fixed in any individual, they change over time. So built into the understanding here is there is an action that is being carried out by individuals whose own priorities can keep changing. Right? And uh, that is, is something that, that, that's important because I'll just spend a minute on the idea of the individual here because uh, there, there are moments when we can be poor, uh, pure. There are moments when we can be driven by desire. That is the economist's idea of, of an individual. And there, are, and there are moments when we could be driven entirely uh, by the desire to, to cause harm to others to take, to do, uh, or even to uh, sort of slip into darkness. This is like the time, uh, this would explain say actions like the person who wrote the first computer virus. That is probably while uh, later on it of course create a market for, for software. But the, for the first person who wrote it, the, the virus was written out of a sheer joy to create harm for others. So the, if there, these three elements are there, it varies not just between individuals, but also within an individual. So the Gandhian approach of the individual had included a strong aspect of time into, uh, built into it. So once you decide on a particular action, including the personally determined set of actions, you need, can, and we all act it out at simultaneously or otherwise in, in, in society, society just becomes a set of interconnected actions. Each action influences the other. Right, and the means used in one set of actions acts uh, is the ends that are that, that work work for another. Right, uh, I mean to take an extreme case like uh, any attempt, like say uh, uh, Stalin, Stalinization in Soviet Union killed millions of of individuals, under the belief perhaps that it might lead to a better Russia, a better uh, country in some sense. Right, but. Uh, uh, the very, but that for Gandhi was an impossibility because the, for the individuals who were paying that price, that was in fact the ends. It wasn't just a means. So the means for one action is actually the ends of another. So you cannot talk of the goodness of ends without recognizing, without in fact talking about the goodness of means. The two are deeply related and the two cannot be separated from each other. Therefore, there's no difference between the goodness of means and the goodness of ends. 
right? Now, in this whole process of, of actions based upon a particular approach and a set of means, there is the makings of conflict. This conflict can come from two uh, broad kinds of, of, uh, of, of sources. The first is the divergence of interests, right? The interests are uh, move in very different directions. And the second, of course, is incompatible actions. So you can have a divergence of interest for very long periods of time without necessarily generating the incompatible actions of a conflict. Uh, in India, we, uh, we had untouchability something as, uh, as cruel and, and debasing as that, right, for centuries. And it was, you couldn't think of a sharper divergence of interest. But it was only when the incompatible actions uh, began to be realized or began to be recognized that you really had the, the uprising that finally, uh, finally uh, brought an end to it, even if it's some of its vestiges remain. Right? So if society is then uh, in a continuous process of negotiations, where people at, at the individual level try to negotiate what actions they'll carry out, there are group interests that emerge and those group interests also are continuously negotiated, right? And for Gandhi, this process of negotiations, if you saw it as a continuing process of negotiations, was built around three uh, broad elements. The first was, of course, the power of each group. And for him, power was not just the economic power or even existing social power, but also the, the power of mobilization, right? And the power of truth if you like. So for Gandhi, uh, truth and justice were not separate. Right? They were intrinsically closely linked. And the power that emerged from, from truth or satyagraha, as he calls it, was built into, uh, into that. He also realized, and I think one of the earliest people to realize that in the 20th century was the role of options. Right? That you could negotiate not just in terms of direct conflict, by simply but also by simply getting uh, sort of activate options. We saw Khadi or the uh, ordinary people beginning to, to weave and uh, to spin were actually uh, developing an option that allowed them to function uh, independently, if you like, of those who were actually in power at a point of time. Right? This is something that was seen as a largely political movement during the uh, political aspect during the national movement. But if you look at the much later period after the communications revolution, it has become the main uh, element of labor negotiations. The people, while earlier labor negotiations were taking place within the workplace, between labor and capital, if you like, but uh, post the communication revolution, post liberalization, post globalization, we're really looking the response of labor to a, situ uh, to a uh, situation they are not uh, kind of happy with or comfortable with is to seek other jobs as well. So even the more, uh, the increase in the salaries of, of say the information technology industry in a country like India has been largely through the power of options or the existence of options rather than the use of power in specific negotiations. And the third element of course is a sense of fairness. Gandhi, of course, believed that fairness had a power of persuasion in it, which I'll come to in a minute. But the fact is that even for others, even those who are skeptical or cynical about, about such claims, there is a huge reliance on, on the power of claiming unfairness. Right? Uh, to, uh, much of Indian politics is about claiming unfairness. In fact, uh, it can get into areas where, uh, you, you, where the more powerful might themselves claim unfairness. So you can be, you believe that you have a, where caste groups that are considered very powerful also claim that they've been unfairly treated and demand reservations. And in fact, the country as a whole is a different debate, but the country as a whole has reached a point where the largest uh, uh, group uh, religious group, which controls 80, per, which represents 80% of the population, dominates uh, the economy, dominates politics, dominates society, as itself made a substantial case of being, uh, being treated unfairly due to minority appeasement. So the, the element of fairness comes into these negotiations uh, very critically. You know? uh, so what we are then uh, in Gandhi's idea, then the movement of that fairness is, is central to the negotiation. It's the starting point in the negotiations rather than at, at the beginning of, of uh, the entire exercise. 
And the movement from fairness to just, justice works through two, uh, two kinds of instruments. One is I would, I would call fairness as an instrument of negotiations, and the other is fairness as an ideal. Uh, Gandhi believed in the persuasiveness of, of fairness. The whole idea of Satyagraha is built on that. that there is the centrality of truth uh, that is constructed within it. Right? And uh, there is therefore an element of nonviolence, which is nonviolence is the only way to ensure fairness in a negotiation. That there'll be negotiations which can get intense, there'll be diversity of interests. And in that, uh, in that element, the only aspect that you can force fair, or only aspect of fairness that, or the only way to maintain fairness in those negotiations through thick and thin, through times of great anger, of great, uh, 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 of great joy to all those peers, the only uh, condition that he laid was that of nonviolence. And nonviolence was central therefore to his idea of fairness and, and the movement from fairness to justice. You cannot think of, of fairness or, the, or justice as fairness in the Gandhian construct without nonviolence. It is, it is at the heart of that process. The second is in a sense uh, uh, that of, in a way you could argue a little closer to Rawls, though it's different in some fundamental ways, is that of trusteeship. Right? Gandhi was once again arguing that you can become, uh, that one way of fairness is to have people in charge who are not attached to any of what happens, anything that happens there. They are not therefore uh, uh, developing a particular kind of, of uh, protecting their interests or anything else. They're just trustees for both, the, uh, for everybody in it. Now, the trusteeship is not just that of capital, but also that of labor, right? And this uh, comes from his idea of karma, that you actually work with, with not just for your own interest, but because it is something that's got to be done. So there is something that is goes beyond. So labor, uh, uh, has karma in terms of what, how it works. Capital, of course, has karma in terms, uh, uh, has fairness in terms of, uh, of acting as a trustee. So each one is acting as a trustee for a particular input into the production system. Labor for uh, uh, workers for labor and, and the capitalists for capital. Right? So in this process, he recognizes that this is an ideal situation. Right? And uh, there is, it is an abstract situation. Right? And uh, he, he makes the specific point that as essentially what you're talking about, uh, I mean, he says absolute trusteeship is an abstraction like uh, Euclid's definition of a point. Right? Uh, it is um, uh, and is equally unattainable. But if we strive for it, we shall be able to further go further in realizing a state of equality on earth than by any other method. So it is in a sense similar. He's just both he and, and Rawls are trying to create a situation where you can take the person uh, or take the self out of a situation, uh, out of an actual practice. And trusteeship for his, is his approach to do it. But unlike Rawls, he doesn't do it through the veil of ignorance. Right? He does it through what he thinks is the power of knowledge. That if people know ultimately that life is more than the material they can get, if they develop a spiritual aspect to it, they would necessarily, uh, if they have that knowledge that, that ultimately uh, we don't take anything with us when we leave this world, if they develop that power of knowledge, that spiritual knowledge, they would be able to recognize the value of trusteeship. Right? He, would, he didn't have too much success with this, with probably the only one trying to, uh, to make some effort in this direction being Jamnalal Bajaj. But essentially, he still argued that it was necessary to have that ideal so that we can, you could move, uh, move towards that. And the power of knowledge in this case would also become a power of persuasion. Right? And, the, and this process here and the institutions here were also ones that would, would, the institutions that were to generate fairness would emerge on the practice of continuing negotiations. If I could have completely nonviolent negotiations and which were allowed for change on a continuing basis, there would be a, 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 process, a, a sense of fairness about those negotiations. It would involve uh, the monitoring of institutions that emerge from that negotiations, right? that uh, institutions here were not an abstract ideal that were brought into a reality, but were rather processes that were sort of, uh, that were emerged from the practices, right? And for him, therefore, the strength of, uh, the, of the process of fairness of an institution did not lie so much in strengthening the in institution necessarily, 
but if an un, but more in recognizing that if there was an institution that had become unjust it needed to be removed right so unjust institutions needed to be removed including laws so if a law was unjust you needed civil disobedience against that law right and the second thing of course was that institutions then could be very just very effective at a point of time but would not be effective if the practices changed and this was at the heart of his argument about the congress that it was the it had a leadership role in the national movement but soon after the national movement it, its basic objectives had been met and therefore it, it had no further reason to exist right so he called for the dissolution of the congress uh, after it had outlived its objectives so uh, if we now try to work out what are really the comparisons of between how do we see rawls and gandhi and i think it's important to begin with a point that they both shared that essentially fairness was a distance from interest right uh, it was uh, the idea of uh, of fairness was in rawls original position was once again that i don't know which side i'm on and therefore whatever i do i'll will be fair and the second and it is the same concept of fairness in gandhi's ideal of trusteeship that i i have no i don't uh, i use whatever labor i have or capital i have in a way that benefits others it's got nothing to do with my it it is distant from my own interest right uh but they were both using very different uh different uh, uh contexts they were both operating in very different contexts and they were both comfortable with the context they were operating in for all uh, it was essentially talking about the social contracts of rational beings you cannot understand the a theory of justice or any of his, his other work without accepting rationality as the only way forward and recognizing that you could you that there are social contracts that determine how our society functions but for gandhi then it was the idea of uh, the context he operated in is one of negotiations between individuals and groups and he recognized that these negotiations can be rational they could be intuitive and they could very often as in the case of communal riots turn out to be irrational right so you're dealing with a lot the idea of fairness was to try and keep it as as uh, as um, uh, sort of non-violent as possible it was try and then strengthen the weak and and use the idea of, of how various groups could put together so the context they were operating in was very different so for Gandhi, for instance, even in the approach to impartiality, Rawls was operating in the rational context, and if he took the individual out of it through a veil of ignorance, there was the idea that the original position, a completely abstract hypothetical situation, would hold. But for Gandhi, uh, the, it was really the need to persuade. Even something like trusteeship had to be; people had to be persuaded to try to follow it. And he realized that that process of persuasion would be different, not only because each uh, uh, individual was different, and uh, the uh, but also within the individual there would be elements of of uh, of pure purity, there'd be elements of of passion or desire, and there would be elements of uh, of simply darkness, which could include the desire to do uh, to do evil. So you have these various places, and the same person could go through these various places. So for him. uh in a communal riot a perfectly good person in the middle of a riot could end up doing unspeakable uh, carrying out unspeakable horrors right so essentially then you have uh, very different approaches to how to reach the point of impartiality though there is the idea of of impartiality as the starting point fairness as the starting point the question was how do you get there uh, whether it is through the veil of ignorance uh, with uh, uh with rawls or whether it's through the power of persuasion with gandhi a more interesting in some ways if you for if a more academically inclined group uh, a more interesting difference is the approach to certainty and doubt for rawls there is the certainty of rationality rationality always provides an answer uh, when rationality provides an answer it is an answer that's been arrived at in a room uh, in a way that removes all doubt right so for him the original position could be derived into very precise two very precise principles right and uh, and it could you could go further and uh, and then list the principles in a way that um, that that 
uh, are to, uh, arranged them in a way that are to the benefit of the least advantaged. Right? Uh, for Gandhi, on the other hand, reality was a doubt. So even when he faces the same situation as the second principle, the point the professor Tellis, uh, uh, mentioned right at the uh, at the outset, right? You're talking about uh, uh, about uh, the same principle of of arranging. Uh, social and economic inequalities in a way that benefit the least advantage. Gandhi accepts that, but for him, there isn't the certainty that, that Rawls is able to generate. Right? All that he talks about is that that choice really comes in only when there is doubt. Right? And even then, his attempt to persuade is primarily in terms of a, is to do no more than to provide, uh, provide a, a tal talisman. Right, as he's, uh, if I will, if I can just uh, uh, read out what you're seeing on your screen, it's a well-known quotation, but nevertheless worth reminding ourselves. I will give you, a, I mean, as he put it, I will give you a talisman. Whenever you are in doubt or when the self becomes too much with you, apply the following test. Recall the face of the poorest and the weakest man uh, whom you may have seen and ask yourself if the step you contemplate is going to be of any use to him. Will he gain anything by it? Will it restore him to control, control over, uh, to a control over his own life and destiny? In other words, will it lead to Swaraj for the hungry and spiritually starving millions? You'll find your doubts and yourself melt away. You will see clearly here that there are three ideas I'd like to, the many ideas, there were three that I would like to emphasize. Uh, one is of course the centrality of the self that the idea of, of fairness is built into it, the sense that you remove the self, that ultimately he's trying to get the self to melt away uh, with, within that. Second, of course, is that you're trying to look at it, uh, is, is the centrality of doubt, that essentially doubt is something that you're forced to deal with, uh, with the, in life. And when you're dealing with it, uh, you need to recognize that it exists. You cannot uh, you cannot, like a sci uh, like science sometimes ask you to do, put it on the back, back burner until it's removed, right? You have to deal with it in a real life situation. This comes from the primacy of action, that when you, are, you, are, you have action as the central element, you cannot wait till something is cleared. And third, of course, is the difference principle itself or his version of it. That is the face of the poorest and weakest man you have seen, and that uh, making him the center of what you, what you say you're going to do. So essentially here, you find the difference between the rationality of, of Rawls, so rationality uh, uh, centered frame, not just centered, but the, the I don't think Rawls willing to go beyond rationality. Whereas for Gandhi, uh, going beyond rationality and particularly into a realm of doubt, a doubt is essential, right? Uh, Rawls also, uh, there is also a difference in terms of, uh, of the larger element here in terms of framing of what is an ideal institution or what is the role of an institution, right? So for Rawls, you use rationality in determining an ideal institution. Institutions can precede practice, though they are just unbust, uh, unjust based upon the, on actions, right? So basic institutions framed to secure fundamental interests are more firmly and willingly recognized. So what he believes here is that once you have the ideal institution, individuals will be persuaded to support those institutions. So your starting point is the creation of an ideal institution, and that ideal institution is to be defined rationally or to be arrived at rationally. For Gandhi, on the other hand, uh, institutions are determined by how they work in practice, and as practices change, so do the roles of institutions, right? You can talk of abstract institutions like his idea of trusteeship, right? But they are at best an ideal to be strived for, right? What happens in reality is that institutions emerge from factors and de facto rules emerge from practice. We can call them corruption, we can call them what they like, call it informality, depending upon what your inclination is, but essentially they are the rules that actually work in practice. Right? And I think really the, the element that happens then is, I think the way the difference comes through really is in the relationship with morality or the nature of, of, of morality and approach to morality. Uh, for Rawls essentially is looking, because of his look, uh, emphasis on persuasiveness, is looking at trying to develop moral sensibilities. Right? He sees uh, uh, a theory of justice as something you should view as a guiding framework designed to focus our moral sensibilities and to put our intuitive capacities more 
uh, uh, limited and manageable questions of judgment. So what he's arguing here is really that essentially morality comes into play, but it comes in at the level of sensibility so that it places less pressure on judgment. For Gandhi, on the other hand, morality was actionable. It could be converted into an action, and he did it by distinguishing between moral, immoral, and the non-moral. Right? That you could have uh, an action that was that uh, that was moral. You could have an action that was immoral. But if I followed a moral action, it did not necessarily me, uh, mean uh, if what met the norms of morality were two conditions I need to meet before I could call it moral. Right? That is, it I had to look at the intention whether I was doing it for the right reasons. I mean, he himself made the point about those who say dressed like he did towards the latter half of his life and uh, did so uh, without um, uh, uh, I mean, without uh, the need to do so, then it could be seen as a kind of element that was the intention would be seen to be, right? That he was trying to associate with the poor. And that approach also required sacrifice. So for him, if I had uh, an action that would be, meet the norms of morality in a society, but did not involve sacrifice or was not done with the right action, a right intention, it was a non-moral action. So if I give uh, a resort to philanthropy to help uh, a particular group for my personal interest later, it is a non-moral action. It is only when it involves an element of sacrifice with nothing, no return to me that it becomes a moral action. So uh, for Rawls, it's a moral sensibility that helps a judgment uh, uh, enables, uh, reduces the pressure on a judgment, if you like. Whereas for Gandhi, it is something that's actionable and morality is a part therefore of, of, active, of active politics. So I'd like to, uh, to end with, uh, with, uh, with the contention that essentially uh, uh, there is uh, for Rawls, uh, the justice as fairness relies extensively on the persuasiveness of what is a rationally perfect theory. For, for Gandhi, on the other hand, he repeatedly argued that he did not believe that a general theory was possible. It is the same kind of, of thinking that led him to reject both the, uh, both the Bolshevik revolution as well as, as the national socialism of, of uh, Nazi Germany. So essentially, both because he believed that no such general theory uh, would work. And for him, the whole idea of justice as fairness was a continuous interaction between theory and practice, an interaction that resulted in a variety of negotiations that could only be protected by nonviolence. So I'll, 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 leave, it, uh, I'll, I'll leave it at that and uh, I look forward to any discussion that may follow. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Pani. Uh, uh, that was great. Uh, there are uh, several people with the hands. Maybe one question before uh, we call the person to ask question. If somebody has put in the chat box as to uh, where do we get to read Gandhi's ideas on justice? And maybe we begin with that, and then we could have people to ask questions. See, I. Unfortunately, Gandhi uh, did not write, uh, he did one or two books, but uh, I'm, his main thrust was spread out over, as we all know, 98 volumes, uh, spread out uh, in, in occasional points. For instance, his, uh, his idea of Swadeshi, his definition of Swadeshi, is in a lecture that he's giving to, uh, to Christian priests requesting them not to proselytize or to make a case against proselytization to them. So it's spread out at a multiple places. Now, there are obviously major works interpreting Gandhi's ideas. Uh, and I've done one of them as well. But I would really believe that the only way to understand Gandhi is to get into those, uh, is, is to get into his collected works and, and wade through it. It's not organized for, a, uh, for an intellectual audience. It is organized for a larger persuasiveness. But there are specific uh, concepts. His idea of persuasiveness, trust of uh, Oswadeshi, trusteeship are best explained by him. I don't think anyone else has captured it. In fact, Swadeshi is largely misrepresented in, in uh, most other interpretations of Kant. Thank you. Uh, Satvik, please go ahead. Uh, thank you, Professor Pani. Uh, I have two questions if I may. Uh, first is, if I have understood correctly, uh, you define justice in terms of uh, legal law sense and thereafter justice as a theory of justice and uh, Gandhian's understanding of justice. Is there a difference between legal theory of justice and let's say Gandhi or Rawls theory of justice? 
And if I can ask another question, if I um, second is if I have understood correctly, you said that the Western society and it, uh, it it gave rise to Raoul's understanding of the theory of justice, and our society uh, gave rise to uh, Gandhian theory of justice. If I have, if I'm trying to make it, um, I was wondering if our societies are so different. If so different, how come we have almost similar understanding of justice like Raoul's? Um, thank you. Uh, thank you. See, so the first, the difference between the legal norms and justice, uh, legal is, is a route to justice. It's a way of, it provides both corrective justice or distributive justice. But, it, it, but the idea of being just goes beyond that. In fact, uh, for Gandhi, it would go well beyond uh, even social norms to personal norms and to even being fair to yourself. Right or being developing your personality in a way that's fair. So justice is a larger concept than the legal concept, though obviously the legal aspect forms a critical part of it. Now I don't uh, I don't recall. I'm I'm sorry if I I misrepresented this, but I don't recall saying that uh, uh, that Gandhi or or Rawls was entirely a product of their societies. Right, Gandhi's uh, Gandhi's theory as Gandhi borrows a lot. From traditional Indian thinking, but he also borrows a lot from the West. Right? Uh, his, uh, his ideas of, uh, uh, of essentially, even his idea of justice in many ways links. You must not never forget that he was, after all, a lawyer trained uh, uh, in the inner temple, and therefore he had access uh, not just to the to jurisprudence or, or theories of jurisprudence, but he also mastered it in some sense, and he was and he was influenced by that. You'll find the great influence of Tolstoy on Gandhi, which is very widely recognized and spoken about. So the idea of, of them, I would see them as, as like all of us, reflecting where we have come from. Right? Those are the ideas that you, you learn ideas on your, uh, from your parents, you learn ideas as you grow up from your, own, and then, but you're also influenced massively by others. And Gandhi's famous quotation about, Opening his windows to influence his elsewhere, but not losing, not being blown off his feet. So that, that's an element that that comes into to Gandhi in a in a very uh, sub, substantial way. But I would uh, argue against uh, reducing these great thinkers, both Rawls and Gandhi, to being merely products of a predetermined society. Yeah. Professor Pelliseri, do we have any other? Uh, your... I think there are questions in the chat mode and There's a question on, on criticism of John Rawls' uh, uh, theory of justice. There are, that's of course been subject to a wide... Uh, it's of course been subject to a, to a wide range of criticism, the most recent being uh, Amartya Sen's... Uh, 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 I'll just try and take, uh, I think so, Professor Sony uh, has a problem with his internet. So I'll just try and take the questions from chat. And maybe if anyone else has any question, one can uh, and can raise it. I will. I will look at that. Uh, I'll try and do that. Uh, but essentially, there is the the question about uh, criticism. I think you, uh, Amartya Sen's idea of justice is in a way, uh, in a way, the most recent one. It also summarizes some of the. I mean, he goes so far as to reject roles altogether. But uh, I think that also gives you a comprehensive idea of other critiques of it. Uh, so. I think, Professor uh, Pellissari, you are uh, muted. Okay. I think. Let me just go through the chat and see if there anyone, uh, any other question. 
Uh, yes, I had a bit of a problem, but mm -hmm. uh, maybe we should ask. Rohit had his hand up. Rohit wants to go ahead. Uh, uh, Rohit, where are you? Yes. You need to unmute Rohit. Yeah. Uh, good evening, sir. Good evening. So you just answered about uh, sense criticism, but uh, it might be a wild comparison, but I just wanted to know. Uh, I have put my question in the chat box also. But sense view is to enhance the capabilities of people, be it education, health, skills, through state support before their participation in the market economy. Can we compare this with Rawls' uh, ideal uh, institution, a rational ideal institution. And uh, Jagdish Bhagati uh, stood for economic growth through reforms, and using that dividends, he wanted to do, uh, do welfare spending. And could this be compared to Gandhi's actionable uh, practice? No, Gandhi's concept uh, concept of action was really based upon, uh, upon the, what happens to negotiations that are taking place in society. So it is the interventions there are not that of the state in general, uh, in, on a society in general, but more in terms of very specific uh, processes where the state was supposed to intervene, right? Like in the Indigo uh, Satyagraha, there was a, it had become grossly unfair and he had mobilized people to intervene in a way that removed the elements of unfairness that were built into it. The same in the case of the Salt Satyagraha, they're very specific interventions that that changes. It's not a general support for the state or, state or for the market. Sen also, I think the idea of Sen's capabilities goes beyond state support. It's really about the role of the individual, the ability of an individual to do what they want to do or be, or to, to follow what they want to do or be, or to realize what they want to do or be. That is their, what he calls functionings, right? So that goes beyond the idea of the state. It could be helped by nature. It could be helped by uh, a number of factors. I might want to breathe fresh air and it might not be possible because of climate change, whatever the as aspects within that, right? So I wouldn't reduce sin uh, to state, state intervention, right? And uh, it, these issues here, both in terms of Gandhi uh, or even sin, but certainly in terms of Gandhi go well beyond the role of the state. Right. And uh, I think it's really about what happens to an individual and, and her ability to negotiate within society. Paul Thomas, will you unmute and ask your question? We can't hear you, Paul Thomas. You have to unmute yourself first. I think he says he needs permission. Yeah. Uh, uh, this is Paul and all of us were watching here, uh, listening to uh, Pani sir. This is Sashank actually. Uh, sir, uh, my question was, when, when we are uh, considering the idea of justice, uh, why is it, why does it become so important for us to understand Gandhi uh, and how different, I, I don't know, this might be a much... A uh, larger uh, question as well, but how different is it from the idea of justice from other th uh, thinkers who were also coming from theory and practice, or or, or the idea that you were talking about? Well, the, the, it's a, it is a larger uh, larger question, as you said, but I would just like to point out to one central difference. For Gandhi, you're, you're intervening continuously in a process that can become just and unjust over time. Right, it's possible for a for a just process to become unjust. It's also possible for an unjust process to become just, and that's where the interventions of various individuals come in. So you're not dealing with an ideal system which you try to to uh, enforce. Though he does do that in the case of trusteeship without much success, but more in terms of the trying to alter the course of a negotiation that's anyway taking place. So for Gandhi, even not doing anything is an action. Right, as we all know. Uh, in the case of the Babri Masjid, et cetera, not doing anything is very often the most important action that people can take. So it's really a part of a larger, uh, larger argument for him. And for him, it's the intervention that matters, right? It is not defining an ideal and saying, okay, I've not done anything or I've done something for that ideal. It's a matter of actively and continuously intervening in actions that are anyway taking place in a society. 
you're never free of influencing that because if you don't do anything, that itself is an action. And I'd not, but as for most others, it's a, it's, it, it is a structure worked out first in, a, in an ideal, uh, if not an ideal situation, in, a, in an understanding theoretical situation and then brought into practice. Here, the, the interaction between practice and theory is continuous and inescapable in a way, because even when you're doing nothing, you're influencing what's happening around. I think that was a very excellent session. I enjoyed thoroughly uh, good understanding and insight on, uh, uh, I am seeing one more hand. Professor Pani, do you want to take? I'm, uh, I'm free, I'm, I'm, I'm in your Okay, hands. I was about to close, but then we will take one more question. Rohit, please ask. So again, a wild question. I just wanted to, I was curious whether Mao was inspired by Gandhi or not, because it is on practice and what you seem to be talking about Gandhi's on practice seem to be similar. I, I would uh, argue that uh, that for Mao, I'm, I'm not I'm not a, a great an authority on Mao in any sense of the term, but from what one has read, he's essentially looking at he starts with a Marxist inspiration and then is willing to modify his actions very substantially to take into account the nature of the peasant economy that he's dealing with. Right, but he's still not uh, he doesn't put practice as the starting point. That he still, even if it is writing, is is a reinterpretation of Marx, if you like, or going beyond Marx, depending uh, in the way, uh, if you like, depends on how you want to want to see it. But in case of Gandhi, everything starts with action. It starts with practice, and the negotiations of practice are what determine what society is. In fact, he goes so far as to as to argue that even what you consider the social is actually a, a person's interpretation of the social. There is nothing you see around you as the social, which is not mediated by your own recognition of that, that that's a social process. If whatever I articulate about society is my own interpretation of what society is. Excellent, thank you. Uh, maybe we should uh, close, uh, as we are closing, I see more hands, so maybe every time I should close. So is Ismila, uh, uh, please uh, ask the question. Uh, hi, uh, it was a wonderful session. And uh, uh, I was uh, slightly uh, curious to know, am I audible? Yeah, you are. Uh, uh, sir, uh, it is a famous quotation that uh, we call justice as fairness whenever we talk about roles. Uh, and uh, here uh, in the Gandhian, we saw justice as a as an ideal, as a as a, an instrument of negotiation. Uh, and how I mean, I want your words on how do we actually differentiate between justice and fairness? I mean, are are, are these two synonymously looking thing? And am I missing some very subtle difference between the two? Uh, I think they're fundamentally different. In fact, Rawls is very clear that they're very that they're different. And uh, basically, when he uh, talks of just when Rawls talks of justice as fairness, he's treating fairness as this as the position from which you can arrive at the rules that constitute justice that go into the making of. When you have a social contract that will be a just contract or or that will ensure justice, you need to have a basis for that initial for Rawls rational negotiation, and that. Uh, basis is fairness. Without fairness, that the rules that you emerge in a social that emerge in a social con uh, uh, contract would not be ideal. That's that. It's so. It's a sort of enabler. It's a sort of uh, of precondition, a prerequisite for for justice, right? And uh, in the case of Gandhi, it's a pre uh, it's a precondition for negotiations that would be fair. Right? So both cases that the fairness of negotiations in Gandhi through nonviolence. Uh, is it creates the atmosphere, creates the context in which your negotiations would be fair. So fairness is is different. It is in both cases an instrument rather than an end, an end in itself. Yes, you will have it as an end, but uh, coming out and reflected in other aspects. But you need it as a starting point. So for Gandhi, you need nonviolence as a starting point, and for Rawls, you need fairness or the original or the principles that emerge from that he thinks emerges from emerge from the original position as uh, as the starting point. 
So they're both starting points rather uh, than more. Though ultimately, whether the rules are fair or not would depend on where they come from. And in that sense, uh, it, it's not, so I would just uh, emphasize that it's not the same. It is one leads to the other. Ashish Kaka, please go ahead and ask. Um, good afternoon, sir. Um, um, thank you for your session. I had a question that um, how can affirmative action where like India, where India's his historical forced social ex exclusion has been uh, addressed or, or an effort has been made to address with a sense of social in, in inclusion, how can that be seen as an intervention of um, Justice and does that fit strictly into either Gandhian or Rawls in interpretation of um, justice? Like, I think I that I think that would be consistent with both, because the the difference principle in Rawls would uh, would include I think actions that benefit those who are the most disadvantaged, and in in the in Gandhi's case too, the whole idea of mobilizing uh, the disadvantaged or seeing the people the person in his talisman as well seeing the person who's worst off. In both cases, the action of the affirmative action uh, would have a positive role. So I would think affirmative action is consistent with both these perspectives. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Pani. We should uh, close. We have held you a little more than what you had promised. Thank you very much. Uh, before we close, uh, let me introduce our next session. Next session is on April 17. The speaker is Chandran Kukutas. Uh, he's going to speak on roles and immigrants. In Rawls' theory of justice or in his just society, uh, everybody is property owning individuals and people don't need to move from one place to another. So does that mean any justice for immigrants? So that's the topic uh, Professor Chandran Kukutas will take up in the next session that is on 17th. I have put in the chat box, many of you have consistently followed this uh, lecture series and therefore please follow this chat box in your lecture series and register and come for the event. Thank you very much everybody, specifically Professor Bani for uh, enlightening on talisman and difference principle. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Pelliseri.